Good day, everybody. This is John Lewis by Vocational Ministry, and we want to finish up with session 10 of this, of this uh, I guess, uh, lecture series or message, uh, um, course series of missions, evangelism, and teaching. And I want to finish up with missions ministry today. Um, if you're interested in the rest of this course, you can email me at bivocministry at gmail.com. That's B I V O C M A N I S T R Y at gmail.com and I will gladly send you all the notes that go along with this course and um, hopefully you're edified in it uh, but before we begin why don't we start out with a word of prayer Lord we come before you we thank you for today we thank you for um, your word and we thank you for your son Lord help us just to live in his footsteps Lord, help us to follow um, you in your kingdom I mean live it out plant churches Fulfill our callings, live according to your will. Lord, I ask you to help us uh, step out in faith, to live different lives and lives that reflect your goodness and your your love and your um, and your kingdom. Um, be with us today as we look at this course, last session today, session ten. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, so um, session ten, missions ministry today. I thought this was a good way of finishing up this course was talking about some practical application about a lot of the concepts we've discussed in this course up to this up, up to this point um and i let's just let's get into it so i have matthew 5 13 through 16 on the screen here and it says ye are the salt of the earth but if the salt have lost his savor wherewith shall it be salted it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is sit on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I think one of the things that in regards to being salt and being light and being different and following Jesus is that there are a couple different ditches that people fall in. Um, the one ditch is I don't want to live differently from the world around me because that's proud and arrogant and all that. If I live differently from the world around me, um, then that's somehow boastful or proud, and it's not. Jesus tells us you are the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world, but if the light of the world doesn't live differently from the world, then it's not really a light. It's not it's either under a bushel or it's not even there. If salt's no different than the food it's going on, then what's the purpose of salt? We're called to live out our differences. The other uh, angle that I've heard of um, people saying is, well, I don't want to jump out and serve God and a ministry position because I, at that point I'm now exalting myself and by exalting myself I am now you know I'm too humble for that I'm too humble to exalt myself to a place of service to Christ and um, if your humility keeps you from living differently or keeps you from being faithfully faithful to serve King Jesus then it's the wrong kind of humility. We are called to serve Christ and serve him in a way that's evident to the world around us. It's a false humility that says we shouldn't live differently. And it's a false humility that says we shouldn't serve because we're scared of the the boogeyman of pride. Um, so let's let's get into it. All right, in the last session, I will... In this last session, I want to finish up with some concluding thoughts on missions and cover some of the details outlined in the course description. Now, when I was putting this course together initially, it was according to a course description given to me that what the school wanted to see taught within their um, within their what, what they want to accomplish with the course. And uh, and so that is why uh, it was kind of a broad description, and that's why you saw me cover a lot of different topics from missiology to uh, basilology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there was a couple things they put in there that I want to finish up by covering in this last session here. So but before I go to the last few points, you need to understand that missions begins in your heart and a life surrender to Jesus. It, mission does not begin... 
when you are a person with a position at a place, um, it begins in your heart today. Are you a mission-minded person? Are you a mission-hearted person? Are you a person that's looking to be on mission? Are you looking around you, looking for the missions that God would call you on? Because we're ambassadors of a glorious kingdom and with a glorious king and being part of this kingdom makes us distinct in this world. Now, there are five areas of distinction that I want to point out here when you're living out ministry. And if you, um, this is where missions begin. Because if we don't have these right, then the rest of it is not going to be sufficient either. Is there's a kingdom distinction that comes from five areas. So I believe that as kingdom people, as people of the kingdom of God, as God's children, citizens of God's kingdom, we are going to be different from the world around us. For one, there's a lordship distinction that leads us to walk differently from the world. So I, I don't walk, I don't conduct my life, I don't make decisions based off what the world's doing because I have a lord, I have a king. I have a sovereign over me and I follow him and this lordship distinction makes me walk differently from the world. Then there's a doctrinal distinction leads, that leads us to believe differently from the world. I don't believe everything the world believes. I don't hold to the values that they hold to because I have a doctrinal distinction. There's things that scripture teaches that I hold to that the rest of the world does not and that, that leads me to have a to believe differently and then a moral distinction that leads us to behave differently from the world i think this is something that we need now when i talk about moral distinction we always jump to you know adultery fornication all that but i'm talking about in every area of life we live differently we behave differently from the rest of the world we don't behave in the old wet patterns of the futile mind we don't we don't behave and with that we don't even war like the world wars the world wars with violence we don't war with violence we behave differently from the world because we have a moral distinction god has done a moral work in our hearts and life then we have a charitous distinction that leads us to love differently from the world the way i love my wife should be different than the way the world loves their you know worldly husbands love their wives um, the way I love my neighbor should be different than how than than how the world usually loves their neighbor, and how I love my brother in the in the in the church should be different than how the world loves their brother. Um, so there's this charitous distinction. Usually comes with generosity, concern, and uh, esteeming my brother as high as I esteem myself, my neighbor. Sorry, esteem my neighbor as I esteem myself and esteeming God above all. And then we have a cultural distinction that leads us to live differently from the world. And I do, I do believe that. One of the things about living out the kingdom is that the king, this kingdom that Jesus has called us to is different from the world culturally. And the New Testament gives us what that culture looks like. And then we live that out. So don't get hung up on the fact that you're different from the world. We're called to be different from the world. If you fit in with the world, there's a problem. But we are to celebrate God's goodness. And his design for our lives. I believe that God has a design for our lives. And I believe you can find that design in the scriptures. Um, and we are to rejoice in his ways. It was this distinction that won over this pastor. And uh, what I mean by won over this pastor to more of an um, Anabaptist understanding of faith. Because I believe that a church that is not different from the world offers nothing to the world. If a church comes to me and tries to offer me something and they're no different than what I already am, then they're not really offering me anything. All right, biblical concepts for kingdom advancement. The difficulty when we talk about ministry and church planting, missionaries, etc., is we can't find these terms in the New Testament. Now, surely these concepts are there, and these are necessary to accomplish the Great Commission, as you. Uh, um, so, how do they fit? Well, the fi the fivefold ministry in Ephesians four eleven, and I have it quoted here. It says, "And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers." Now, when I was a when I was a pretty staunch, staunch Baptist, I study this. I would have canceled out the first two apostles and prophets. Basically, those had a, those had a a place in church history, but they were no longer with us. They were no longer there, um, and so those two offices now were gone. Unless, so the apostle especially was gone. It was it was not even there anymore. 
um, because you had the original 12 and that was it. And then um, after they died, the office has never picked back up. And then so then you and then you also had profit and the profit. Uh, I believe that if they if the role did exist, basically it was just a proclaimer. Um, and that's I mean, that's just, but but the office of prophet didn't actually exist anymore. You usually won't go to a Baptist church and find someone who operates in the office of an apostle or the office of a prophet. I would have canceled out those first two. Um, they're no longer active. And the last three is what we need for healthy missions and ministry advancement. So what were the three that I thought we should have or that I was taught to have, I guess, was evangelists, pastors and teachers, that that's what we needed. And if you look in the Baptist world, that's pretty much what you're going to find. Uh, pastors, teachers and and evangelists. Um, and but we see that church planting and missionaries and stuff, that's not in the New Testament. That's not in the New Testament. So where do they fit in? Now, I no longer hold that, that to be true. I no longer hold that these first two have been completely canceled out and no longer in operation whatsoever. Now, let me explain before you write me off as a heretic and think that I'm I'm going to endorse people going around and saying, I'm apostle so and so you should listen to everything I say or what I say is just as is just as strong or just as weighty as the scriptures. You, you, wait, bear with me. Um. I understand that the terms are more broad than just the initial offices. So there was the apostles and then there's an apostle. There are the chiefest apostles and then there are less apostles. Paul, when he argument, argued, he says, I am not inferior to the most eminent apostles or chiefest of apostles. So there was chief apostles and then there was apostles beneath that. Because um, the term apostle does not refer to only the original 12 include it includes paul and as such the uh, and say yeah, sorry the term apostle does refer to the original 12 including paul and as such were authoritative authoritative to write scripture and speak on matters of truth in the church and were jesus's mouthpieces for the church now i would see these as chief apostles like i said before and you can find that in second corinthians 12 11 through 12 in fact i'll read it for you second corinthians Twelve eleven through 12 says, I am become a fool in glory. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and in mighty deeds. You see that this was a special office of an apostle. And this and he's talking about these he says i'm nothing behind the very chief as apostle he's saying i'm i'm just as high as one of the 12. and the signs of apostle which was signs wonders mighty deeds patience uh patience and signs wonders and mighty deeds and these are done by the apostles as a sim as a sign that his that he was one of the chiefest apostles but the brethren in in uh second corinthians 8 23 are called guess what apostles Epaphroditus in Philippians 2.25, guess what, is called an apostle. Now, I believe these fit because the office fulfilled a function that is not just the on the original 12. So, yeah, the original 12 had a function, but some of these functions, even though, yes, we don't have people writing scripture, scripture is complete. We don't have people that are um, going out um, fulfilling that initial office all over again. I don't believe that necessarily. But I do believe that there's a function in the church for the office apostle. And I think maybe one of the reasons we see such a weak church is we see people who are not fulfilling it. The, this office is gone um, out of the church for the most part, at least for mainstream Christianity. But the original, uh, the term means, and it's, it's a derivation, derivation of the Greek word epistolos, which means one who is sent. Um, one who is sent and is a man. And is a man. Uh, hold on. And as a man who is a builder, and we would understand the term them to be missionaries or church planters because they build and establish churches. So what's the function of an apostle? Well, the function of apostles, one who is sent. They are advancing the kingdom of God and they are um, 
and they are building and establishing churches. So when we send a missionary into a foreign country and they're building and establishing churches, they are fulfilling the role of an apostle. Now they're not writing scripture, they're not doing all the, the they're not doing everything that Paul did, but they are functioning in a similar office in the sense that they are building and establishing churches. So when we have church planters either here at, here at home or we have missionaries, which we would call them, uh, domestic uh, missionaries compared to foreign missionaries, but they're missionaries and they're church planters and they're fulfilling the will of uh, the role of an apostle, though they don't carry the authority of the original twelve or the chiefest apostles. Um, so let me break these down how I think that these would fit in. So let's let's look at these each one by one. And I'm again I'm, I'm working on on Ephesians 4:11, where it talks about and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now let's look at this. Um, you have church planting missionaries today, and I again I believe these are biblical apostles. These aren't the original, but these are in the New Testament, and these are church planting missionaries today. Um, they go and make disciples, establishing churches where they're sent. These will be able to function in multiple capacities like evangelism, teaching, preaching, and pastoring, leading to see through the birth of a new church. I see them as house builders. So when we talk about going into a town and these people will build a house for the Lord. And, and I'm not talking about a literal house. I'm talking about the church. They're establishing a church where there once was not a church. That's what these church planting missionaries, biblical apostles are. They, 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 get, they have multiple giftings that allow them to function as a, as, a, as a leader in multiple capacities. Now, compared to the rest of these offices, these are special giftings, special, um, these are special giftings and specific giftings, but an apostle will have a little bit of each. You know, he'll, he'll, he'll be able to be an evangelist. He'll be able to be a pastor. He'll be able to be a teacher. He'll be able to be um he'll be able to uh function in a minute he'll have gift of, min of administration he will he will be able to establish leadership he'll be able to do it be a disciple maker he's going to have multiple giftings in multiple areas to establish churches and that is what a biblical apostle does and i see those as church planting missionaries so yes you could say as church plant our church planting missionaries or church planters and missionaries in the bible they're not even in the bible they are in the bible they're just called apostles then you have the um and again, they're the house builders. They go and they build a house where there once was not one. And God is established in the community through a church that is being built from an apostle. And then you have the evangelists today. So these are biblical prophets. So if you've ever been to a revival, what happens is you go to this revival and an evangelist usually will come in and he will strengthen, edify, rebuke, and confront the church now, a lot of people do turn this into an, um, a, a, a witnessing event, but a revival is the idea that you're reviving the church, okay? And, and so I view these evangelists, these revivals, um, as biblical prophets. They call on the church to return to scriptural faithfulness and revive the church in its role to be a light to the world and disciples of Jesus. Now I see them as house builders and restorers. Now, uh, house, re, sorry, house remodelers and restorers. So churches over time, if they're not, if churches over time, it's just like any, like, you know, my house over time, I see things in my house that need to be repaired. I, I, I you know, have a plumbing leak. I have, I have caulk that's, that's, that's ripped. I got to cut it out and re-caulk my sink. I have to, um, I, I, I want to, um, I want to restore what was there. I want to remodel what was there. That's I see these are models. So just like any, like just like a regular house, the church can fall into disrepair, or it can fall into it can be just uh, need need uh, TLC. And I view that these evangelists or biblical prophets come in and they start fixing what needs to be fixed. They start fixing what is broken in the church. So you have a church, the, you know, obviously even with people, things fall in disrepair and all that in the church. And then the evangelist comes in, revives that, remodels that, makes it, calls it back to returning to scriptural faithfulness. Now, why is this office like, well, can a pastor do that? Can't a pastor just come and, and make sure that everything, well, a pastor could. And a pastor, part of the pastor's job you're going to see here is, is a maintenance, is a kind of a maintenance guy. But I will say that there is a special role here because when I served as a pastor, there were certain things that uh, my that 
that my flock, my people would listen to others, but because I was a regular figure in the church all the time, they, I was common, you know, I had become common. They were used to my preaching. They were used to my teaching. They were used to everything about me. And you get this guy, guy coming in and he exhorts the church to return to a more biblical form of Christianity and I, and I and I've seen it where uh, I will I have, will have said something for for a few years and it just won't take root and then you have someone come in who's fresh and new and he exhorts the church and like hey that's a good idea I'm like yeah that's a really good idea I wish someone would have said that before and I I mean and I could think I have so many I have pastor friends that would have said the exact same thing they can say the same thing for for years and then they have an evangelist come in or a speaker come in who's fulfilling this role and they will exhort them to scriptural faithfulness and the church will be like, hey, that's a really good idea. I sure wish you would have said that, Pastor. <laughs> Pastor just laughs like, oh man, oh man. Um, but yeah, so I see them as remodelers, restorers. So they take what's broken down or what needs repaired and they bring it back up to speed or they, they make it uh, usable again. Then, so you have evangelists today. And so I don't, I don't think that evangelists today are functioning as a biblical evangelist. I think they're functioning as biblical prophets. Then you have evangelists biblically. So what is an evangelist? Well, these are those who spread the gospel personally, corporately, as they advance the kingdom and see sinners redeemed and disciples made. And um, so what does this office do? He's, this is the guy who's out preaching the gospel. He's out in the community. He's out in... He's out ministering to people. He's out sharing the, the, the word. He's door knocking. He's, um, he's door knocking. He's uh, sharing the gospel on a regular basis. He's looking for ways to, he's handing out gospel tracts. This is what this guy does. And for what it's worth, you need to understand that when you're talking about these offices, that sometimes evangelists will be frustrated with pastors and teachers because they'll say, well, why aren't you out sharing the gospel all the time? Because they think they should be like them. And past teachers will sometimes be frustrated with evangelists, like, well, someone's got to stay and teach the flock. Someone's got to stay and minister to the people who are here. And I've seen I've seen where people get frustrated with each other in this. And it's like, man, both of you are needed. I mean, bo both of you are needed and, and we're needed. So what do I see these evangelists do? I see this as, as an addition builder as they continue to add to God's church. So let's say you have the initial church, you have the church that's built and established by the apostle. You have this evangelist, a uh, biblical prophet come in. And he says, hey, you know, there's this house has fallen in disrepair. We need to we need to bring this back up. You need to take it back. You need to say this is what scripture says and you're not doing it. And so the uh, biblical prophet calls it back to faithfulness. And then evangelists. So apostles build, uh, prophets uh, restore, remodel. And then I would see evangelists as addition makers. You know what? We need to add a room back here. You know, we need to add we need to extend out our, our living room. You know, we need to add a second bathroom or a third bathroom. We need to do something. And so these are addition, these are addition makers. That's how I would view them is they, they add to God's church. So, um, so the house is still there. It's the same house, but now it's, now it's bigger because it has more people in it. They're adding to God's church. Just like a builder would add an addition to a house. That's, it's just, I'm trying to give you a picture to kind of help you understand how I think these fit together. And then the last one is pastors, teacher, not the last one, sorry, second to last one, the pastors, teachers, ministers, overseers, elders, and I, and I put these as, as ministers. These are the people who are leaders in the church. And um, I see these as those who oversee and maintain the church of God. Now, you have the house built. You have someone who's going to, who's going to uh, remodel the house. You're going to have someone who is adds to the house but you have to have people have to have men who are willing to oversee and maintain the church of god maintain the house of god and so they oversee the church they oversee the body of believers they maintain and they they will often function in many different capacities including um including um Inclu including remodeling, restoring, and, and, and addition, adding to the church, but they're overseeing the church. They care for the church um, and see it grow in godliness as they regularly serve God's people in teaching and oversight. Now, I see them as maintenance and care workers, and people don't realize, when I was at, when I was at college, I worked at a, as a, on a maintenance crew, and, you know, we weren't impressive. We drove around an old van, a very old van, and we repaired things on the college campus. 
And people didn't realize that the reason why the campus functioned so well and was so nice and so well and so well uh, functioned well was because it was well maintained by a maintenance crew. You uh, and any pastor who's ever served a church that didn't have a lot of people in it would understands this because when you, if you don't if you're a pastor and you don't have a lot of help you know to maintain your facilities you realize how fast and quickly those facilities those facilities can fall into disrepair you know bath the bathroom that's been closed for uh for six months the the uh the the um the sink that hasn't worked for a year the leak that hasn't been fixed for a long time um and these are and but i mean and that's what and that actually happens within churches i'm not talking about buildings i'm talking about the people there are things that need to be repaired things that need to be oversaw things that need to be fixed and sink and 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 basically that's where the pastor comes in it's like hey there's something over here that's not right i need to go fix that hey i need to oversee this i need to oversee and 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 work through this uh so pastors uh you can view that as shepherds these are leaders Teachers, those who edify the body through scriptural teaching. You got ministers, those who people who serve. You got overseers, those who exercise leadership, leadership, exercise oversight over the church, and then elders. Um, and they also, and um, I, that's why I put these all in one category. And then elders who also oversee the church. And they are, and they care for the church. They make sure to, when discipline is needed, they exercise discipline. When they make sure the scriptural teaching is taking place, they make sure that. Um, they make sure that the body's edified. And then um, the last one here is I have uh, deacons. Uh, deacons, uh, the term literally means servant, diakonos, okay, means servant. Um, some would even translate it slave. And, and, they, and they aid the body of believers in, in the service to one another and assistance to, over, to the overseers for the health of the body. So what do they do? They serve the body. If you Acts 6, they chose seven to serve. These, I, I do believe that's an example of the first office of the deacon. The, this office of the deacon is, is very crucial, very important, but it, it, because they aid a body of believers. They aid in the service of the believers. Um, I, I think that they're extremely crucial and that we should have them. So they serve the body of believers in the sense that there's a need in the body, the deacon should be there to help serve that need. Remember, they're waiters of tables. And... Um, and if they, if the, if the leadership, uh, pastor, elder, overseer, whatever you want to call them, bishop, whatever you want to call them, um, needs help in a certain area, then the deacons are there to help fulfill that, uh, fill that need. And, um, and, uh, and I, I think that we need to emphasize how important this role is. Um, from uh, from my background, uh, the office of deacon was uh, quite regularly abused and was viewed as a um, a committee that that basically would dictate the church, and that was very unhealthy. And people got a bad taste in their mouth for that. But I think deacons are extremely important. Not only did people get a bad taste for it, but so much of that ministry went um, un, uh, unfulfilled. So much we had, we I've, we've I've seen it. Talked to many ministers where they will have l real needs in the church, but the deacons were so caught up in doing and a and in, in, in things that really wasn't part of their ministry, and so their role as deacons failed. But yet, you know, and caused a whole bunch of problems, and then everybody suffered because of it. So, I really think there should be. A lot of emphasis placed on what's the role of a deacon? How can they be a blessing? How can they help the leadership? And I think that, as Paul says, we should let them be tested first before we put them in office. I just the, the older I get, the more I serve. I, I go to a church now where the deacons have served very well, and they've done a really good job, and have been in a tremendous example for me of the the spiritual health of a church body that has good deacons that serve regularly. Um. And then just to kind of finish things up a little bit, the building plans are the scriptures, particularly the New Testament. So how do we know how to build this church? So you're building churches, you're remodeling churches, you're adding to churches, you're maintaining some care for the churches. How do we know what do we use for for this house building or this church of God? Well, the Bible, the scriptures, that's our design. We got to stay faithful to the design of the New Testament and particularly New Testament because that's the that's the um, covenant we're under is the new covenant. Now, the Bible is the building code, building plans for the church. 
And only as we are faithful to those plans are we faithful to the true builder of the church, Christ. So ultimately, when we are fulfilling these roles, these five, this fivefold ministry, our ministry is only faithful because Jesus is the true builder. Jesus is the one truly rebuilding, the, building these churches. Jesus is the one who's truly remodeling and restoring these churches. Jesus is truly the one adding to these churches. Jesus is truly the one that is caring for these churches. Now he's doing it through the offices, but he's doing it. So we have to retain, we have to remain faithful to the teachings of Scripture um, in order to do that sufficiently, and uh, and that and and in that way we're staying in line with the true builder who is Christ. All right, so let's talk about some vocational ministry real quick. Um. This opens the door up to allowing your vocation to tie into your ministry and the larger purpose of the Great Commission. So there are two different kinds of vocational ministry that I'm going to speak of. The first one is called a paralleled vocational ministry. And a paralleled vocational ministry is a situation where one's vocation opens doors or aids in the ministry that one serves in. Some examples of this are you um, some examples of this are um, medical vocation in foreign missions so someone says i went to medical school and i got I, i'm now a nurse and now i go over to another country and i serve as a nurse or a doctor and while i'm over there i'm also building churches and establishing churches and sharing the gospel and doing all that so you, you're they may not let in a missionary but they'll let in a doctor um, and then another one is a counseling vocation and pastoral ministry i've met many pastors that are also life coaches they're also they're also sometimes licensed counselors, and they will actually counsel people in situations, and that's part of their pastoral office. So um, I've, I've seen bivocational pastors as like, well, I'm a pastor of the church here. I have an office here, and they run a counseling service through that office at the church, and that, that, aids, in their, um, that aids in their vocation. A teaching vocation in youth ministry. So it's, let's say someone's a youth ministry, youth minister, and they're also a teacher at the local school. Man, what a great opportunity! So now we see these things go parallel. They, they're parallel vocational um, opportunities. And then you have direct vocational service. And direct vocational service um, is a um, is a situation where one's vocation is their ministry. And some of these examples are a translator. Someone might be a translator. And they're fulfilling and they're translating the scriptures and that might be their vocation. They're doing that full time to reach people groups and they're translating the Bible. Um, number two, they're a commentator and and or expositor. These are people who are writing common common uh, common uh, commentary. Sorry, excuse me. Commentaries for the, the Bible. They're expositing the scriptures regularly. They're trying to teach the scriptures. Um, a, and I've seen people who, just to kind of move, keep going with this. Someone who's a writer, they write they write books that help aid the church and in their call, and they and they sell those books and they make an income, and that's how they provide for their family. And then you have a counselor. Someone says, "I am strictly a Christian counselor, and that's what I do, and that's a direct ministry." An aid worker in a nursing home, um, a Christian school teacher, and then I put here a pastor, teacher, or missionary supported by the church. And um, I just uh, I and I lift out a whole bunch of scriptures down there on the uh, I on the bottom. And uh, and again, I'm not against you know this 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 um, there is a, there is a question of are we should we have paid ministers should we not have paid ministers should we should we not and, and the truth is I think it's perfectly fine to pay your minister. I don't think it's fine. I think you got to be careful because he will might make decisions that might reflect his income more than his more than his office. But you but but it's so it's fine. I, I see so I see perfect examples where uh, where where ministers can be paid for their for their service. Um, I think to put a load on a on a person that that requires them to fulfill a pretty strict duty and then say, well, we're not we're not going to take care of you. Even though you do it, That's, I don't. I don't agree with that at all, and um, and uh, all that. Now, again, if you look at the first one there, um, which is paralleled vocational ministry, that would be very similar to what this YouTube channel is all about, which is a paralleled vocational ministry or a bivocational situation. And I think those those are just fine uh, having a bivocational ministry. But let's start. I want to deal with some areas where when we talk about missions and, ex and evangelism, we get all excited. We're like, oh, yeah, this is amazing. We're going to go plant churches, we're, you know, storm the gates of hell with a, you know, with a squirt gun. 
you have to be careful. You have to be careful and because you don't want you want to be a well balanced minister. You don't want to be you don't want to burn yourself out and you don't want to be neglectful of other areas of your life just because of that. So let's work into that real quick. All right, so I have a few missions that every Christian is to be part of, building from small to large. Again, so this is so you're not being neglectful of your other obligations to the Lord. All right, first is home ministry. The first and primary mission field you have is your home. If you're married or if you have children, um, your home is your ministry, um, is your first ministry. One of the biggest mistakes we made as evangelicals was that we thought if we took care of the church, the church and God would take care of our children and marriages. I've actually heard ministers say, you take care of the church of God, the church of God will take care of you and your family. So basically what we were saying, what was said to me, I didn't say it. What was said, what was said to me was if you don't disciple your children, don't worry about it, or don't disciple your wife, don't worry about it because the church will disciple your children. The church will disciple your wife. Don't worry about any of that. You take care of the church of God. And I think it's a big mistake. Um, for those who know, I, I run, a, run a small lawn care business and I'm just going to be very frank. Sometimes I am so busy taking care of other people's lawns that my lawn doesn't get cut. And I told, I told my wife, I said, it's, it's frustrating. I said, sometimes when I, um, when I go out and I may, and I, and I do some pretty, pretty big, impressive jobs. I'm not bragging. It's, it's not very difficult, but I do some pretty big, impressive jobs. And I just told my wife, I said, you go to these places and it just looks like, I mean, it looks like a pro was there and, and this lawn looks immaculate and everything looks amazing. And then they cut, and then I come home and my, my yard hasn't been cut and, or, or my son who's 10 will cut it. And, but he, you know, he doesn't stripe or anything. And then it's not been trimmed because I'm the only one that really can trim, uh, because I have commercial equipment and I'm like, it just looks really bad. I'm like, why can't I do this? So you got to be careful that you don't get so caught up in what you're doing out there that you don't take care of what you have in your own home. And I'm, I'm guilty of it as much as anybody. Um, there, there is, the, I, that's exactly what happened. So we need to make our home a priority. Okay. So nowhere in scripture are we promised that if we take care of the church, God will take care of our children and marriages. It's not in there. In fact, when I heard it, it was an excuse for disobedience. They didn't want to lead. They weren't leaders in their home. And so, um, I know I've, I've challenged that model quite a bit. Um, and I'll be honest with you, as even if evangelicals are paying for it, as, as, as we're watching our children walk away from any meaningful faith in Jesus, you have a fellow who is completely committed to being in the church every time the doors are open and, uh, they, uh, you know, forsake not, forsake not, forsake not, they assembling yourselves. I just hear it all the time and, and they do that and they're there all the time and they're there all the time. And then they find out that, that their kids have, have made some, um, you know, have gone astray. And it's like, well, why did you do this? I kept you in church your whole life because it wasn't just about keeping them in church, it's about raising them and the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Um, and it's really sad. So divorce at divorce is rampant and we have become almost indistinguishable from the world around us. And, and that's just the, that's just the reality we face. It's not something I'm trying to rub in. It's just the reality we face. And so many People will look at that stuff and say, ah, oh, that stuff, it just means we have more work to do. You're right. We have work to do, but you got to be willing to do it. And, um, and because spouses and parents have handed off their responsibility to children to their families, let me read it again, because spouses and parents have handed off their responsibility to minister to their families, your family, your home economy, your church inside your own house has to mean something to you. And it has to have a priority. And I'm, I'm, I'm feeling convicted even talking about it because, you know, I've, I've been in a very busy season of life. But you need to minister to your own family. So the first place is your home. Your home is the place where you minister. And I have some scripture references you can read right there if you're interested. Uh, secondly, you have the local church ministry. Um, your mission is to edify the body of believers according to your giftings and callings. So you're serving in a body of believers or you're in a body, you're, you're called to edify that body. You're not called just to be there as a spectator. We have this mentality now, but you're actually called to edify the body of believers. Each person in a church has their place and purpose in the body of believers. So each person has a place in the body. 
and there's a reason why you're there. There's there uh, in my body there is not a part of me that is that has no function of all, no function at all. It everything serves a function. It's it's if it's not if you have a purpose in the church, but what is that purpose? Now there are many needs in the church, and we shouldn't assume that someone else will do it. And this happens all the time. And I saw this when, especially when I'm in ministry. Ah, someone else will do it. Ah, someone else will do it. And we have a lot of people here. They'll take care of it. And a lot of people assume that. And what happens is someone else will it will fall on uh, uh fall on a small group. This typical was called the 80-20 rule. If you've never heard of it, um, I think I don't know if John Maxwell came up with it where it came from, but but it's called the 80 per 20 rule where 80 percent of the church members do 20 percent of the work and 20 percent of the church members do 80 percent of the work and that's pretty accurate in fact i would i have seen churches where it's more like 10 and 90 10 percent of the church are church members are doing 90 percent of the work while the other 90 percent are just showing up it's important that we share responsibility in all areas of work and um and personally speaking if a church has more giftings than need, then it's time to plant a church and invest into the larger kingdom work of the gospel. Now, I've seen both these situations. I served in a church that didn't have a lot of help, that didn't have a lot of members, it didn't have a lot of people, it didn't even, and it didn't have a lot of giftings. And that church struggled. It struggled quite a bit because everybody assumed someone else would do it, and it, it burned out a few people, and uh, it, it burnt me out in a lot of ways, and it's not healthy. And now, uh, now I go to a church where um, we have more giftings we know what to do with. More, there's more frustration about lack of opportunity than there is about um, service. Um, and the way that, so they have more giftings and the people there, and, I, and I, I've told our elders this, you need to be launching a church. If you have people who are called in the pastoral ministry, like we probably have five, 10 men who I would put up there as, as 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 at least qualified candidates for pastoral ministry, if not if not qualified people. I, I don't I haven't tested them personally, but they have they have a they they would be they would be um, they would be qualified and they would be willing. But because there's not an opportunity, because we have you know we already have four we have four elders and like eight deacons and and it, it just it, and there's like no opportunity and. I, I've told our elders, why aren't you taking those other people and launching them into a church plant? That's what you need to do. I think you need to do that. All right. We need to invest in larger kingdom work of the gospel. So we have two generations that need to be ministered the most, and this is out of your local church ministry. Um, the developing generation and the mature generation. Yet it is most difficult to bring people into these vital areas of the body. Uh, I have ministered at nursing homes, hospitals, and homes. Um, and and I, I, I again I, the de, the mature generation needs to be ministered to. These are people who can't can't do what they used to do. They 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 can't they can't. Um, a lot of them are struggling with empty nesting. You know, empty net they're empty nesters, and that's a lot more difficult than what you think it is or what I thought it was. I'll be honest with you. My wife went on a small trip, and and uh, I had to work, and so we had a few families from church uh, uh, babysit our children while I was working and while she was uh, gone. And I tell you what, it was. I thought, oh, you know, it's going to be kind of nice. The house is going to be quiet. I'll be able to get a little more sleep. You know, no, I I, I didn't sleep good at all. I, I I really struggled. I mean, I'm used to hearing kids. I'm used to hearing talking. I'm used to getting up and people being there, and I'm getting up and no one is with me. And it's hard. So empty nesting and stages of life and dealing with the difficulties of retirement and no longer feeling like you have something to do every day. There's a lot of areas of struggle that we don't recognize. People have been put in a nursing home. Their family doesn't come see them very often. Um, and it just and these are these are ministries that need to be that need to be care of. We are. I mean, the elderly, the caring for elderly can be summed up in three words: companionship, comfort, and compassion. Listening to their stories, uh, comforting them. And companionship, it takes someone who's very patient because sometimes these people at this point in their life have lost all filters and they'll say things that you're like, yeah, that's not a good thing to say, but you, you've got to overlook it. But you, they need ministry. They need minister to. And so I, I was, all, I mean, one thing I love about my wife and one of the reasons I knew I should marry her was because she ministered to the mature generation. 
elderly generation in our church and and, and her church growing up. She had an amazing relationship with these people and she loved working them working with them. She actually worked in a nursing home. And that just really drew me to her. And every church we've been to, except one, she has connected with the older people and just has built wonderful relationships. She has truly a gifting in this area. And uh and uh and I it it makes me just love her that much more because this is such a vital ministry. Um, and many things that we take for granted, they, they love, and that would be a simple phone call. If you even called someone from, I'll just pick up the phone, call them, um, and say, Hey, how are you doing? And, uh, and I, and I, and sometimes you'll be on the phone for a little longer than you were expecting, but that's part of it too. But call them. Of course, if you, I mean, if you have older parents, do this for your parents, the sound of children, I, I can't tell you, it says, Oh, I just love the sound of your babies. Oh, I just love the sound of your children, the laughter. And, uh, and, you know, and soon my kids will be in a, in a scuffle. They'll be, they'll, you know, um, not scuffle. They'll be, they'll be fighting with each other. You're arguing. And I'm like, kids, stop, you know, don't argue. And she goes, I know. And she goes, I know it's frustrating. She goes, but one day you'll miss these days. And you know what I mean? And, and then a warm hug, you know, give them a warm hug. Let them know you're there. Uh, you don't have to be a gifted person. You just have to be a caring person. Um, and I give you some scriptures here to read through in regards to that. And then, and, and, and don't forget the developing generation. These are the ministering to children, ministering to youth. All of us can point back to our childhood and think of somebody who is extremely influential. And oftentimes that person was in the church. And yet this area is, is not put much emphasis, uh, emphasis is not emphasized. So I would just encourage you to think about those areas of ministry. Um, and then, uh, and then let's move on to local community ministry. Um, the local community ministry. Um, so you have your home, you're ministering to your home, you're loving on your spouse, you're loving on your, you're loving on your children and you're ministering to them. You're being faithful in that. And then you serve your local church or whatever capacity you feel called to do, whether it be, um, like I gave you an example of developing ministry or, or developing generation, the developed, the mature generation serving in evangelism and whatever, serving that. And then there's local community ministry. And one of the things that I've really felt convicted about that, uh, that I have, that I have taught is that a church is in a, is a certain community for a reason. If your church is in the community and your community doesn't know it's there hardly, except for your church sign, that's a problem. That's a big problem. You, Remember that verses we read at the very beginning of the session where I said that we are to be the salt of the earth and light of the world. How are you supposed to be the salt of the earth and light of the world if you don't actually serve in that world, if you're not actually out in it? And um, so the church is called to serve her community as a witness to Christ. Your church exists in your community to minister to that community. If your light is under a basket or just in your meeting house or your church building, how are you being a light to your community? In fact, that, I mean, uh, that's what the world would love. Just stay in your church building, stay in your church building. As long as we are salt, as long as the salt stays in the salt shaker, it makes no impact on the food on the table. Um, we just got done grilling out um, yesterday and I put seasoning salt on some of the things I was grilling. And I had tried this one before and I tried it out again and it was amazing. It was amazing. So my point is, is what's the point of, I mean, what's the point of even having it if it's not going to go on the food? So salt left in a salt shaker, no use, to, no use to God not, not out in the community if it's just sitting there on the table, not being used. The world should be a better place because the church is there. You remember this from when we talked about the spreading the kingdom, the birds that nest in the branches. The world should be a better place because of the, uh, the sorry, the world should be a better place because of the church. Um, Jesus made his world a better place. Jesus made his world a better place for the lowly, the outcast, humiliated. We all know this. We all know this. And yet the, the lowly, the outcast, the humiliated, the, 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 the ones that are the lowest in our communities are, are some of the ones who never see Christians serve. And that's one thing we, when we started our mission and now we have a wonderful church that's hosting it and overseeing it, is they're ministering to that community. And that is true Jesus work. Because they are they are making his, making the world a better place for those people, and uh, and they're doing the work of Jesus. So one of the reasons Jesus made in, such an impact on society around him is because he was out in it. We need to be out in it. And Jesus, though, you got to remember, is still out there working, serving, 
saving and calling out to the lost sheep of the world. He is still out there doing it. He is out there serving. So when we go out and we serve God in our communities, we are joining God in something that he's already doing. Um, the where, he, where Jesus says that God is good both to the just and the unjust, and he sends rain on the, on the good and the bad. Um, we are, we're called to do the same and minister those in our own community. So the church is called to serve our community as a witness to Christ. Um, and I believe that Jesus ha is out there working, a serving, calling the lost sheep of the world, like I said. And I believe Jesus has a special place in his heart for the needy, the infirm, the helpless, and the innocent. I believe he has a special place, and they should have a special place in our heart too. This is the gospel in action, in that Jesus hears the silence, he helps the needy, and he advocates for the helpless. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Now, I call this the social gospel. I know the social gospel has a bad name, but it, this, if the gospel isn't moving you into some kind of social uh, interaction, then you're missing, I mean, we're really missing the Great Commission here. Um, I, yeah, again, I call this uh, the social government. I believe Jesus' compassion on people motivated him to heal, feed the thousands, and meet the needs around him. Jesus did these things because he knew what people needed, and it motivated him. It motivated him. So um, it's his compassion motivated him to heal, feed, and feed thousands. Um, all right. To continue this, um, I know for me, we ran a mission center, a mission, a mission that offers a place for people to come if they struggle with addiction, homelessness, et cetera. They get a meal, they get resources. Of course, they get ministry from the word and they, sure, they hear the gospel. Um, our mission is recognized by AA, the homeless shelter, the county for families and people who are struggling with trying to rebuild their lives. We get people sent to us regularly from these different organizations because they see our mission as something that's making an impact in the community. Now there may be there there are many options for social service such as right to life pregnancy centers homeless shelters food banks child evangelism fellowship foster care and adoption all these things are things that you can do to make your make the world a better place and I would encourage you to do that so giving freely to others as you've been given freely so you're serving your community so you have the lo home ministry the local church ministry now you got a local community ministry as well and let's now move on to church planting missionary uh, ministry. All right, church planting ministry. This is a great task of making disciples and establishing churches of disciples in communities. And I gave you the Great Commission there and I gave you a number of other passages. Um, so most of the writings of the New Testament are known by the author writings. So you've got the book, the first, second Peter, first, second, third John, Jude, Matthew, Luke, you know, representing the authors. But with Paul, all his writing, we don't have a book of Paul. We don't have the epistle. Uh, we don't have um, the, uh, the, letter, the letter of Paul. We don't call it that. All his writings are known for the recipients because he wrote so many letters. Much of Paul's writings are to churches or regions of churches, like when you look at Galatia. Now, these, these were churches that Paul planted on his missionary journeys. Every church that exists was at one time a church plant. So every church you see, it was one time a church plant. And Paul fulfilled this and we can fulfill this too. Now, one thing that I advocate for, one thing we're doing, um, a way to begin this work is to plant a church in a town that has disciples in it as a branch church. Now, what I, what I mean by that is like, so for example, that's what we're doing. We have a home church. This is where most of our, in the beginning here, we're still fellowshipping with our home our home church quite a bit. And then we're meeting on a different night or meeting on, a, on Sunday evenings in the town that we're trying to church plant in. And so we're staying connected. And this allows us to serve in church planting without vacating a church family. Um, now, it's okay if you vacate a church plant family to church plant, but it makes things much more difficult. And I have church, planted a church like that, and that's much more difficult. Um, but it's really great to have that uh, church 30 minutes away that that 
uh, we still can participate in. People are praying for us. They, they, they financially support us in some ways. They send down workers. They're, they're doing a lot of things that, and because we're close enough, we're not close to everybody, but we're close enough that they can come participate. And we call it a branch church. Now, I would do a few things. I'd study the place, people, and culture where the plant will be. You need to be interacting. One thing that that I'm working on right now is getting more involved in my community. I I uh, I want to be more involved. I want to do my shopping there. I want to go to restaurants there. I want to interact with people there. I want to talk to people there. I want to go to their garage sales. I I you got to get and know the people that you're doing that your church planting uh, uh, will uh, will be. You get to know the people that you'll be church planting amongst. So we you visit the towns, the stores, coffee shop, garage sales, other churches. And we, even though we've already started church planting, we're still in this phase. We're visiting a whole bunch of these other areas. You live in the community you're trying to win. I'm always an advocate for that. It's really hard to reach a community you don't live in. I would really encourage you to live in the area that you're trying to win. And now some people are like, that's not necessarily possible. Well, it, you're right. It's not necessarily possible. It's still possible to plant the church, but it's going to be much more difficult. Um, establish a culture with multiple families. I've seen this happen where multiple families will step into the church plant and create a Christian culture, establish a church culture there. And then basically you're just growing that church and, and that makes it easier. And people aren't having to move two or three hours away. Um, and then you make multiple avenues of connection with the community. People need to, I mean, making connections will do a lot of things um, that, I, that I'm not gonna take the time to go into here, but it will, it will help you establish these connections uh, it would help you establish your establish a ministry or a church in that community with through these connections. I'm still leaning on certain connections and that we were built in six, seven, eight years ago that are still a blessing to me and still a blessing to the community. So, um, yeah, I want. Uh, uh, okay, so let's 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 do one more. Let's do one more. And so right now we're in church planting ministry. Let's go to foreign missions ministry. Foreign missions ministry. Now, this is a great task of making disciples and establishing churches of disciples and communities around the world. Much of what is said about church planting can also be said about foreign missions. Foreign missions require a significant commitment and support to be accomplished. Short-term missions can aid an established church in fulfilling its larger mission and also convict the hearts of future missionaries. So, um, Foreign missions. You thought about do short-term mission trips. Short-term missions can aid in an established church, so in fulfilling a larger mission. Um, so you're a star church, you're still sending people over there to do missions, or you, you're sending people over there to do missions and also convict the hearts of future missionaries. Uh, convict the hearts of future missionaries. And so I, I think there, I, I think almost every missionary that I've ever met said, I knew God called me to this because we took a two-week mission trip to a certain place that was outside of my home country. And I got to know the people there and I realized this is exactly where I needed to be. Um, now, earlier we spoke of children of the kingdom of God being seed. Remember, we um, it's the parable of the wheat, the wheat and tares or uh, yeah, wheat and tares. So the parable of the sower, the seed is the message of the kingdom, the word of the kingdom. And then the the seed of the wheat and tares, a good seed, are sons and ch or children of the kingdom being dispersed throughout the world bearing fruit. These are the ones who are bearing fruit of the first parable. And Jesus is spreading throughout the world as they bear fruit in those areas. Now, I'm not the one who is equipped in this area since my ministries have been domestic. However, four missions is just a broader in scope of being faithful in ministry across the globe. Um, and so four missions are very, uh, a very good option, I think, for you to pray for. Now, at the end of this, I have an action plan, um, what you think you should do. So after taking this course, what do, you, what do you think your next step is? How do you think you should fulfill God's will for your life? I truly hope that this course was a blessing to you and that you were edified by it and that you will use the resources that we discussed in the course to go make a difference for the kingdom of God and for, and for the gospel and see people redeemed. So um, you guys have a great day and God bless.